thank you, and thanks for coming in from the outside. It's too, too hot out there, too, too hot. So we're, yeah, I know. So I'm going back to Chicago after this. So today what we're going to talk about has to do with speed, making speedy decisions. My disclosures are there and enclosed somewhere in, in the sky. So this is a patient, 20-year-old female college student, develops bloody diarrhea during her midterm examinations and goes to the student health center. Remember, I'm on the undergraduate uh, campuses at, right where we're at, University of Chicago. So go to student health. She's told the diarrhea is due to her nerves. Her blood's due to her hemorrhoids, but when you asked, did anyone look at your bottom, they said no. So apparently hemorrhoids were examined um, with uh, the doctor looking at the computer screen. Uh, no recent exposures were suggested of food poisoning. She's a non-smoker. She gets worse and she goes home. So, you know, we're coming up to uh, the Christmas break, and as you know, when your college students go home, that's when all of a sudden all hell breaks loose. And the parents bring her to the local doctor first. She's pale, she's tachycardic, having pain and bloody bowel movements. And luckily, the local doctor decides perhaps this is someone to send to the emergency room, and she was admitted to the hospital. Uh, she's uh, dehydrated, she gets IV fluids, she's anemic, hemoglobin was seven, but then subsequently um, that was co concentrated, so she's transfused. And abdominal pain, NPO, and she gets an abdominal x ray, which I I, this version didn't have the actual x-ray, mild dilation of transverse colon, thumb printing, and edema suggested of colitis. Again, she's been uh, not diagnosed previously. A school, stools are collected for infectious agents, which is imperative. She does have fecal leukocytes, but she has no culture, no E. coli, no ovarian parasites, no C. diff, and she actually, even though she had bloody diarrhea, was tested negative for Giardia and the cryptosporidium. Uh, she's in the hospital, uh, the GI is called, they do a sigmoidoscopy, and once they get into the rectum, to the rectal sigmoid, they see this picture you see there, the mucosa is gametous, erythematous, you use ulceration and mucopus. The uh, inflammation is described as circumferential continuous with no skip errors, although the exam was limited to the rectal sigmoid. So um, the first issue that comes up is about doing a colonoscopy in someone with severe ulcerative colitis with some dilation of their colon, of fever, um, tachycardia, and um, one of the areas that uh, we see a lot of mistakes made in our patients who are sent for full colonoscopy in this setting, it's actually contraindicated in severe UC. The risk of perforation is higher, and, it, and actually the perforation can be somewhat spontaneous. There's also a risk of megacolon from doing the scope itself, from insufflation, and from narcotic medications. And uh, there's also the, the risk of sedation in someone whose hemodynamics may not be exactly as you want them to be as you're trying to get around that high uh, left uh, splenic flexure. Uh, sigmoidoscopy uh, is strongly advised instead, limited uh, generally to the rectum or rectal sigmoid, minimal insufflation. If you give sedation, ideally, it would not be with narcotics. To, it could exacerbate um, uh, megacolon or short-term acting narcotics. Um, exam to rectum, perhaps rectal sigmoid. You can see how things look as you can going around. Uh, you don't do a retroflexion in the rectum with someone with severe colitis. And um, when you do biopsy, specify that your pathologist should um, stained uh, for CMV, even if they're not on immune suppressants. Actually, it's rare, but I've seen it. Um, uh, happen where the patients, just because they're so sick, they actually have CMV, no other risk factors. Uh, earlier uh, in uh, the day, there was a very nice video uh, session that many of you were probably at. It showed endoscopic severity scales for ulcerative colitis. Um, the, these scales are important. We're using these in clinical trials. Generally, mild disease are patients who just have a granular mucosa. You can see edema, and uh, the um, inflammation is still circumferential without skip areas. Once you get more coarse granulars, small ulcerations, friability, this is moderate colitis, and severe is frank ulcerations and spontaneous hemorrhage. And what we're finding is that the endoscopic severity predicts colectomy. So patients who had, in this study, severe endoscopic colitis, 93% of them went to colectomy um, with deep extensive ulcers. Those who had mucosal detachment, 30%, large abrasions, 26%, and smaller well-like ulcers, about 17%, while patients with moderate endoscopic colitis, about a quarter of them went to colectomy. Um, and uh, you can see this, uh, superficial ulcerations um, uh, in those who went to uh, surgery were, were, were actually still pretty high. So 
certainly, well, this is not a, a, a um, can, maybe people balance the lights. We have half the lights on, half the lights off. It's like if I'm wearing a patch over one of my eyes here. Uh, uh, but certainly this is someone who you want to be very aggressive with your medical therapy in because otherwise this person's heading to a colectomy. So there are many different studies that have looked at predictors of poor response to surgery. Um, and uh, I want to key into you guys this three day. A lot of studies have suggested by day three, you should be looking for the following. First of all, stool frequency, if they have more than eight a day or, or greater than five after three days. If they have very bloody stools, fever, tachycardia, elevated CRP, these values were in two different studies. Dilation of the transverse colon greater than five sonometers. Um, uh, okay, uh, it's, it's, I guess someone didn't pay the electric bill here. Uh, hemoglobin being low, serum albumin being low, I'm sorry, it should have specified low albumin, high sed rate in an older study, bandemia, uh, ongoing flare, uh, active infection, uh, hospitalized setting, severe endoscopic lesions, or dis and patients who have actually um, had a very short period of time between their initial presentation and uh, this event, um, about 10% of those patients have uh, fulminant uh, colitis, it's their initial presentation. Okay, so we're doing a little more experimentation with the light. You know, the Disney light show actually starts tonight at 9. We're going to do a little preview in here. Okay, uh, so typically we give these patients IV steroids. And luckily, particularly in patients in whom this never gone through this before, they usually work. So this is data from multiple studies. So two weeks out, you can see that, that um, IV steroids, you have range from 50 to 93% um, of remission or a substantial response. So pretty much right off the bat, these patients, you're going to be giving IV steroids. Remember, her infectious workup was negative. And there are actually, this is the, these are the same studies that reported serious adverse events. They're actually pretty rare. Two weeks of, of high-dose IV steroids, very rare to have any serious adverse events. So that's pretty much been the standard. So in the hospital, IV steroids were, in fact, started. I want to point out the second line that seems to be forgotten by many people, but hydrocortisone enemas uh, also started. These were um, used also in clinical trials. But by day three, the patient still has had a minimal response, still multiple poorly formed bloody bowel movements and cramps, and she asks, when am I going to get better? So, so day three, not, not day 33 when I'm about to come here for the conference, <laughs> day three when she's in the hospital, this is the time to determine that you're gonna do an intervention. So, and this is not, this is not one of the, um, oh, is it? No. no, it's not one of the audience response questions. So the option one is, should you wait longer on IV steroids? Option two, should you add cyclosporin? Three, TAC or limus. Four, infliximab, or five, re refer to surgery. So I don't remember if it's an audience response or not. So um, here's some of the data for IV cyclosporin. Same format I showed you before. This is two-week data, day 15, patients who had response rates. Almost all these studies were the standard four milligram per kilogram body weight. These were older studies, and you can see that you had between a 56 to 91% response rate. Now these uh, studies, though, were criticized because they said, well, you know, great, a lot of patients respond, but how durable is that response? Uh, there were few serious adverse events in two weeks of, of IV cyclosporin, um, although, you know, 14% in this group, um, it's not super low, one in seven, but generally very low uh, serious event, adverse events in the correct patients. And the key, as you probably know by now, is not the cyclosporin, but it's thiopurines. Thiopurines maintain a cyclosporin-induced response. The yellow is short-term response, the green is long-term response. So the yellow bars you've already seen. The green bars are um, long-term response, follow-up in years is on the bottom line here. So you can see six years, 40%, two years, 62%. So you're looking at perhaps, uh, let's just say a 50% response rate over one to six years out, um, maintained by the thiopurines. You don't stay on the cyclosporin. Uh, our study at the University of Chicago showed the same thing. Patients who got cyclosporin plus 6 MP arrays of thioprin had a 66% response rate. Cyclosporin alone at five years, it was only 40%. And we subsequently looked 12 years out and showed, oh good, we're doing the light show again, that 54% of patients actually were still well with their colons off steroids at 12 and a half years out. But the key is the 6 MP arrays of thioprin. The British also uh, showed uh, azathioprine 60% 
um, maintenance of response at about what, 100, 180 months out. Uh, so perioperatively, the surgeons actually don't um, oppose cyclosporin. There are, these are older studies because we use cyclosporin a lot in the past that talked about uh, many of the major surgical groups suggested that they did not see higher problems perioperatively with patients who would be given, tried salvage cyclosporin. Oral tacrolimus has also been shown to be effective in this study. Patients which were mixed. They were refractory oral or IV steroids and their remission rates, clinical remission 20%, mucosal healing uh, 80%. Perhaps we use that in patients who aren't IV steroid um, refractory. Infliximab, the first infliximab trial was not a Crohn's trial in IBD, it was a UC trial, but it failed to enroll. We only had 11 patients in them, half of them got infliximab, uh, I mean, sorry, four of the eight patients who got infliximab um, responded, um, and none of the three patients who got placebo responded, but the study never reached full enrollment. Uh, subsequently, uh, Probert published data with infliximab in green versus placebo in yellow, suggesting that infliximab was not good for IV steroid refractory ulcerative colitis. But then Yonero did a, a, a tri randomized trial where patients were randomized, and this, this actually um, is colectomy rates here, uh, randomized to, IV, um, to infliximab uh, or to placebo, and um, showed that um, primary colectomy or, or death within three months, there weren't deaths, but colectomy rate with placebo was two-thirds versus this 29% with infliximab. And uh, this is the same data over here, and here's the survival courage. You can see that most of the patients who go to surgery do so within the first two to three weeks, and then it's kind of it's straight out from there. But in real life, many of us have not found infliximab to be as effective in the IV steroid refractory patients, and the question is why, and we may be getting some answers this has just been an abstract form so far. Study looked at nine IBD patients, three with Crohn's and six with UC, given three doses of infliximab. Fecal samples were collected within 14 days, and they watched clinical response, and they found that the patients were dumping the infliximab in their stools, particularly right after their infusions, and non-responders had a higher amount of drug loss in the stool. So here's the answer as to uh, you're getting the golden toilet in these patients as the infliximab seems to be washing through. They're also from DDW, have shown that higher trough levels have better outcomes. Patients who have trough infliximab greater than two are much more likely to be in remission with an odd ratio of 10 and much less likely to go for colectomy. Steroid-free remission is best in patients with infliximab and without antibodies to infliximab. Steroid-free remission by trough status, patients who had a high infliximab trough were in remission, steroid-free remission versus those who had a low trough and colectomy by infliximab trough status. Colectomy rates were very low if you had good infliximab levels. So hopefully if we can get infliximab turnaround times much faster, you'll be able to know whether your patients have the drug in their system after you've given it to them. There are some studies now looking at accelerating infliximab dosing. This is a retrospective study looking at some patients got standard infliximab and others had three doses within three and a half weeks or so. And patients who had accelerated dosing, their colectomy rate was 6%, 7% versus 40%. Uh, and that actually was shown, this is the um, short term, and, but long term it actually equaled out. So it means that the biggest difference with the accelerated dosing is in the first month or so. Subsequently it balances out. Um, and now there are ongoing studies to determine the optimum timing of dosing of per infusion, trough levels. We mentioned that the, the trough level turnaround is too long right now, and we may hopefully have point of service testing in the future. Uh, trial uh, looking at comparing infliximab versus cyclosporin, patients failing IV steroids but still pretty sick. They got two migs per kg of cyclosporin, not four migs, or infliximab. They were all put on azathioprine, steroids are tapered, and they failed if they didn't respond within a day. They weren't in remission within uh, three months, had relapsed death or colectomy. This has only been an abstract, but basically showed a week out, at least the, uh, the infliximab and the cyclosporin patients seem to be just as well, although no one's been able to reproduce such a high um, number in infliximab in the past. Treatment failures were about equal as well, too. So what are my rules? I always tell my fellows there are Russ's rules, and these are the Russ's rules in infliximab. Um, we, up until we get very con convincing data, inpatient's more of an outpatient thing, although perhaps doing the accelerated dosing will be better for inpatient. Uh, inpatient, particularly if they're IV steroid responsive, it seems to be a good way to go. Patients who failed are allergic to 6MP or azathioprine. 
They can do infliximab if they have renal disease, hypertension, or seizures, and if they're reliable, and you can send them back to the referring physician, while cyclosporin is really only an inpatient therapy. If they've already failed adequate AIDS of 506 MP, it's not an option. You cannot give if they have renal disease, hypertension, seizures, or advanced age. They have to be very reliable, and they usually have to follow up at a center where you can manage these patients. You do not give IV cyclosporin and IV infliximab together. Um, however, you may find some patients do well with cyclosporin, but then when you try to put on azathioprine and 6-MP, perhaps they get pancreatitis, you wash out the cyclosporin, you can give them the infliximab. Uh, similarly, you can wash out cyclosporin pretty quickly. It's a little less clear about how quickly you can wash out, and, uh, wash out infliximab. Again, hopefully we'll have better levels in the future. Um, I'm going to actually just mention surgery is not risk-free. Um, surgery has problems of reoperation rates, small bowel um, or, uh, obstruction, sexual dysfunction, pouchitis, incontinence, and infertility. Um, there are, this table is in the slides that you all have access to, as well as these rates. So in summary, though, I do want to mention you should exclude infections, exclude megacolon, limit the endoscopy to the rectum of sigmoid, avoid narcotics, which will be our next talk, initiate IV steroids, and intervene by day three with cyclosporin or infliximab in surgery if they're not getting better. Because remember, when you're dealing with these patients, Oh, next slide. When you, you want to be like me in the blue car and get to the finish line first. Thank you very much.